a traveler along 20th century time, inquirer for gentle traces, translator for symbols, a writer, diplomat, journalist, and new Nam's emeritus professor. Margot Glantz is the author of an impressive amount of literary work. She was the founding editor of the scholarly literary review, Punto de Partida, and won the Mexican literary prizes Magda Nonato and Javier Villarrutia on account of her own books, Las Genealogías and Síndrome de Náufragos, respectively. She has authored more than 20 fiction and non-fiction books. In 1995, she was appointed as a fellow of the Academia Mexicana de la Lengua. She has also been a visiting professor at Yale, Cambridge, Princeton, among other universities. Her essays on Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz have been widely recognized, as for her recent work, Esguince de Cintura deserves to be maimed. I began to read books in my father's own extensive library. Dad and Mum came up from Russia, having little wardrobe to wear and many book boxes to bear. They were economically ill-fated, so we had to move from house to house often. Every time we had to move, we loaded up those book boxes and a big black piano. Margot Glantz goes through the traces of ancient cultures as if perusing through time-worn, enigmatic, full-signed, rugged rows, so avidly looking for fresh sensations emanating from the remains of eras long gone. In weighing up, all of those archaeological sites being recently named Heritage for Mankind by UNESCO, and comparing them, as far as I know, I positively like better Monte Alban. In weighing up, all of those archaeological sites being recently named Heritage for Mankind by UNESCO, and comparing them, as far as I know, I positively like better Monte Alban. There are many things entering into this consideration. First of all, the long period that had to elapse, more than 1,000 years, for getting these buildings and open spaces completed, and the continuity in both structure and orientation they achieved in spite of the many eras the construction had to go through. The same we can say about harmony and ornamentation, which far from monotony, seems to impart a sense of serenity and peacefulness to the whole place. Even the landscape appears to be in consonance with the architectural setting. Those heights, which seem to be both hills and pyramids at the same time, in fact, they are pyramids being camouflaged by a crude time. They baffle me in a paradoxical way, since in spite that they stand for human work, they seem to be a part of the landscape, showing no contradiction between the artificial and the natural. I am beholding a tree, a laurel, in the middle of those ruins and the monks scattered stones, which in another time were a part of some of the surrounding buildings. Yet they seem as if they were carried out to be upright at the trunk of that tree. Now I am seeing a perfect pyramid being crowned by shrubbery, resembling an utterly artistic Pinnacle Freeze. In contemplating Monte Alban's ruins, I recall the brilliant archaeologist Ignacio Bernal, who was somewhat puzzled by how the Zapotecs could master so formidable architectural excellence while being so coarse sculptors. Indeed, 
he deemed Zapoteca sculpture over-decorated, too ugly and violent, in sharp contrast to his own aesthetic notions. And I am still amazed about how much so dexterous an archaeologist as Bernal certainly was, and to whom posterity owes so much, could have held such a derisory impression about that aspect of the Zapotec culture. Was this contrast a symptom for a world picture, rendering equal honors to both life and death as that ball game pitch bears witness to? Monte Alban's framework shows an impressive, astonishing regularity. It was outlined according to astronomical patterns, and its buildings were constructed to achieve geometrical proportion among them. Most of the buildings repeatedly show an ornamental device being known as double scapula. That form is intended to imitate the jaguar's jaws. A highly stylized jaguar, certainly. Over there, we can see the astronomical building standing at odds with the rest just because of its patchwork. Rudely carved stone blocks are piled up in a somehow untidy manner, yet they are glyph engraved symbolizing what seemed to be Zapotec urns. Also, there are glyphs symbolizing human-like figures, dancers, swimmers, sickly persons, or whatever you want, peculiarly wearing helmets. There is another glyph showing a penis-mutilated human form. As we can see, that eunuch presents a rose-like form as a substitute for its penis. That rose-like form seems to be hieroglyphic, symbolizing blood. I guess, possibly, that glyph stands for war prisoners being symbolically castrated in order to drastically cut off reproduction. A severe form of conquest indeed. That stell, or scriptured stone piece, is remarkable since it stands for the oldest Mesoamerican numerological sample. It was written on porous blotting paper-like stone. The sense I get is that the stone is absorbing the signs, and that could stand for a metaphor of written language, especially for those who industriously write as if they were writing on stone blocks, or those who consciously write on writing. In front of that stell, I remain baffled by these questions. As a modern-day user of the word processor, writing almost as fast as my own thinking goes, I wonder how thoughts could be engraved on such monolithic stone blocks, even at the cost of the sculpture's health and fitness. These archaeological pieces were dug up from diverse archaeological sites to be housed in this museum, where they seem to be out of their own historical context, just to acquire a new meaning as a collection. This leads me again to brood about the contemporary meaning of writing. Contemporary computerized writing has metamorphosed the very act of writing. Compare it 
to that huge stone block, paradoxically puzzling us with both full meaning and nothingness at the same time. Look at these stone blocks, depicting dancers and conquered people going to the sacrificial temple. Do they mean what we think they mean, or is their meaning beyond the reach of our conventional reading? Then, as I get up here and see that ceramic skull, which seems to have acquired a superimposed meaning through the passage of time, it is a skull related to other extraordinary pieces, especially these willfully rugged old faces, and that Joko's smiling face. What are they laughing at? Why were some skulls colored in red cinnabar and turquoise? Is this entombed, bleached red, emblematic of the sun? I honestly do not know. However, I keep going back to my questions with regard to the act of writing. At the present time, this humble site does not project the relevance it had in ancient times. These ruins you see hardly correspond to the majesty Montalban once made a show of. These naked, regular adobe walls, exhibiting its own rugged entrails, surprisingly reveal past grandeur. The fretted frieze resembling those at Mitla, and yet we're in the face of a humble, sober, moving place because of its own naivete. Make no noise and take a look at that fretted pink frieze, exhibiting the double scapular pattern we have already seen. Can you see it? It seems to be the one portraying genealogical symbols at its bottom. Look at that gate door. It is crowned by male and female engravings. They are symbols for the power of family. Now, look inside the jaguar's jaws. That double scapular form. Do you see that little funny figure? It seems a circus performer. He has bright eyes, beard, and ear guards. It's funny. Not so funny, however, is a femur. He quivers. It stands for his own genealogy and property rights. It is not a bizarre thing getting buried next to one's own femur, so resting forever while keeping the very symbol for property rights. Whatever our interpretation about these odd things may be, I am still amazed in seeing that the carved owl, that bleeding rose, and that woman-like figure gripping a jade collar, the woman's body seems to have been mutilated while her husband's body seems to be intact. Even more, he has an extra femur. This sight seems to once have had a bigger importance than it now seems to have at present. There remain 
a few stucco carved remnants, namely the god of rain exhibiting a headdress representing rays and a mouth standing for water flow. Additionally, there is a glyph representing the jaguar. At its left side, there is a deity, a symmetric form in the manner of the classic double parameter. in here, two ideas dawned on me. First, that I would like being buried right here. This idea seems either a tragic one or a megalomaniac obsession at least. Yet, I do yearn for a dignity we cannot find in modern funeral rites. Secondly, I'd like to have been an archaeologist like Enrique Fernandez, who happened to found a tomb like this one and knew how to decipher it. Yet, as a writer, I find some sort of poetical mantra and science fiction about it all. Having read most of the authorized books, I have concluded that what this culture aimed to transmit remains almost as dark at present. Mystery, however, doesn't preclude amazement in the face of this marvelous geometric interplay between superimposed forms, especially that of the double scapula and inverted U forms. From where I stand and observe, this interplay between double forms does protract new geometrical forms, reverberating the gradual shifting of light and dusk in projecting their own shades, lintel apexes replicate the engraved geometrical forms which they embrace. This tomb was excavated as recently as 1985. Its upper nave is just a plain knoll supporting that marvelous piece which stupefies me. The stupefaction leads me to recall the Führer archaeologist Carter provoked after digging up Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt. Too much hoopla blew up from this groundbreaking find. Gossip about terrible death for those profaning the tomb circulated all around the world at the time. Fortunately, I have my own feet out of the grave now. I am now standing upon that seemingly natural green knoll amongst orange-colored wild flowers. I withdraw into myself in contemplating this lengthy, otherworldly valley, trying to make a sense about the following story a local tombkeeper told me. He told me that alongside the dignitary resting in the tomb, a living man was entombed to keep him company. Then, once the living man began to feel himself suffocated, he desperately happened to make stripes on the crypt walls by using a ceramic scrap. 
that circumstance could well be the cause for that violent, primitive form of writing. Whether it be true or false, that story seems to provide a solid argument for either a tale or a novel, since it tells us about a desperate man being entombed alongside a corpse, violently trying to communicate himself to the outer world by means of a peculiar form of writing he superimposed upon another one. One of the most enigmatic aspects of pre-Hispanic cultures was the ball game, which is still practiced by local people. Yet, having no relationship to its ancestral meaning, a bizarre intermix between joust and death. We modern-day people are accustomed to relating sports events with entertainment. Pre-Hispanics, however, related it to death in the most violent and traumatic way. At that time, contests often ended in the execution for some of the players course, the losing side. As I bring this to mind, I come to the logical conclusion that pre-Hispanic tombs were the destination for many ball players, while prisoners perhaps after playing the last game and so fulfilling their own ill of fate. regards to the cryptic pre-Hispanic view of the human body, I would like to refer, by way of comparison, an exhibition of anatomy and art in the Renaissance I recently visited at the Royal College of Art in London. The relationship between the human body and the arts is as old as the earliest civilizations, but it was Leonardo who first attempted to systematically describe and depict the human entrails, their physiology and functions. The exhibit was composed of a large series of drawings depicting human organs, arteries, veins, intestines, liver and heart, all in great detail. The exhibit enabled the public to make comparisons between male and female bodies. Curiosity enraptured me in seeing drawings depicting both male and female thoraxes, human entrails. This feeling of curiosity I couldn't bring to mind at Monte Alban. Those are rare dancers in dislocated positions and exhibiting enigmatically tattooed bellies related to human sacrifice, which nourished a religion. Look, for instance, at that figure, impassively cutting through its own epidermis, its skin, its belly.
Before coming to Monte Alban, I was pretty sure I was still I, as I felt quite self-confident on my own scholarly knowledge. Now, I have begun to entertain second thoughts, for being here, all of my bookish learning got reduced to insignificance.